engaged in transportation planning and decision making. Uh, so a little bit about who we are. Uh, California Walks is a statewide uh, nonprofit <coughs> advocacy organization. Our mission is to be the statewide voice for pedestrian safety and healthy walkable communities for people of all ages and abilities. Uh, our partner in this project is UC Berkeley Safe Track. Uh, Safe Track is a research institution affiliated with UC Berkeley, and their mission is uh, the reduction of transportation-related injuries and fatalities through research, education, outreach, and community service. So um, I will be moderating uh, today's session, and I'm just going to set the stage a little bit, but I'm going to then turn it over to my two colleagues here, uh, Kate Beck uh, on the, I guess, your right. <laughs> Uh, she is a uh, current master's uh, in city planning student at UC Berkeley and a graduate student researcher at SafeTrack. Uh, her focus is on transportation planning. And um, my colleague here in the middle, uh, Jamie Fuhrer, is the planning and policy manager for California Rocks. Her focus uh, is mostly on uh, local work in Santa Clara County, specifically San Jose, uh, but she also uh, helps with uh, this project, which works all around the state of California. So this issue, uh, I wanted to, to pick up from the, this morning's plenary of the learning legacy of our uh, transportation system. I mean, I don't think it's news to anyone, but I really don't think it hurts to repeat this constantly and to spread the message that the decision, the, the transportation investments that we've made in the past last to this day, and the transportation decisions and investments that we make now will last for 50, 100 years, way right past our lifetime. So it's really critical that we get it right and that we learn from the mistakes of our past. So this is one of my favorite murals uh, in Los Angeles. Uh, it depicts, um, I think, very viscerally and very humanly the, the effect of infrastructure investments uh, and how they can negatively impact communities. Uh, for those of you who don't know, um, in California, we went on a big highway building boom uh, post World War II, and uh, not shockingly, a lot of communities of color were torn up by our highway investments. Um, this mural depicts um, basically uh, on the left side of it, you can see communities um, physically separated. Um, by these freeway investments in East Los Angeles. Uh, and, and I think this is a great depiction of the fact that the physical separation has a very real impact on the sort of um, mental, social separation that these physical uh, infrastructure investments have on folks. Um, on the right side of the mural, it depicts um, the forced eviction of a very uh, thriving Mexican-American community that once existed in the Chavez Ravine to build Dodger Stadium. Mm -hmm. um, and, and here's what East Los Angeles looks like right now. It's crisscrossed by no less than seven highways. <laughs> um, ex residents have experienced lots of air pollution, lots of traffic. Um, and that's not to say that the residents weren't involved in the decision-making process. Uh, in fact, they were. They, they pushed back very hard, they flooded city council meetings, and yet they failed. Uh, and I think this stands in really stark contrast to the much uh, wealthier, whiter residents on the west side of LA who did the same thing and yet were able to stop uh, highway projects such as the Beverly Hills Highway. And again, to put a human face on this, um, this is the forced eviction of Aurora Vargas uh, in 1959, the last remaining residents uh, of the Chavez Ravine um, project. Uh, another thing to note about this project was um, when the city was uh, going in, uh, talking about redeveloping the property, they had promised that there would be an affordable housing development there, and yet that promise was broken, and instead we got Dodger Stadium. Mm -hmm. And lots of, yeah. <laughs> um, so, given that history of transportation inequity, uh, my organization, California Walks, uh, really works, I think, uh, I, try, I try to distill it into kind of four big buckets of how we try to work to advance transportation equity. So the first one is, around equipping residents with the skills and knowledge to participate in our transportation planning and decision-making processes. Oftentimes they're needlessly complicated, cumbersome, and, and just boring, let's be real. Um, 
And so making it relevant to folks and, and, and making sure that they know how to navigate the process is really important. Um, secondly, for those of you who work in the public sector, uh, creating the, the actual opportunities where the public can meaningfully weigh in on the planning process is so critical. Um, I, I feel like historically in the planning um, the sector, there's always been this sort of kind of token public engagement, and so that's a little bit of what our um, program tries to address, creating those meaningful opportunities for public participation. Uh, third, this issue around transportation decision-making bodies. So I mentioned that the east side LA communities, you know, they flooded city council uh, chambers, but you know, they didn't have that political power. And I think that's really reflective of who's on those decision-making bodies. And so um, one of our areas of work is really trying to change who sits on boards, commissions, and peers and the like. Uh, and lastly, um, one of our big uh, areas of work is around shifting the transportation investments to address historically disinvested communities. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Kate now to talk about our Community Pedestrian Safety Program, which uh, doesn't accomplish all of these, uh, but mostly the, the top two. So, I'll turn it over. Um, hi, so I'm going to go over um, the pedestrian safety um, data in terms of um, this idea of transportation equity. So I probably don't need to tell all of you, but um, pedestrian deaths and or deaths and injuries are a big issue in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, in California, pedestrian fatalities. Um, are twice that of the national average though, and one in four traffic deaths is a pedestrian. Um, we also know that there's a huge disparity in terms of the types of communities that are exper experiencing these pedestrian deaths. So lower income communities are um, twice as likely to um, be in a pedestrian collision compared to higher income communities. And so this data is from a uh, government a, governing, a go governing report um, done in October two thousand or August two thousand fourteen, um, which looked at um, pedestrian fatalities and census tracts as well as um, poverty rates. Um, so then, going into that more and looking at um, racial groups um, and pedestrian fatalities. So people of color are more likely to be involved in pedestrian fatalities, specifically African Americans um, in the 20 to 64 years age range, and then um, Asian communities and Pacific Islanders um, in the senior age range. Um, and that also fits with, um, the, with severe in injuries. So, um, African American youth are much more like have much higher um, rates of severe injury, um, and then Asian Pacific Islander, Hispanic, and um, African American communities have higher rates of injury um, in relationship to pedestrian injury rates. Um, it's really it's really important to note that um, collision data doesn't tell the whole story, though. There are um, a couple issues with only looking at collision data is underreporting. So in San Francisco, there's recently a report that 40% um, of pedestrian severe injuries go unreported. Um, also, near miss data and exposure data is really difficult to find and is not part of um, crash data. Then another really important issue is safety and security issues that aren't related to vehicles for pedestrian um, Use. And so one of the biggest issues um, that we face when we're working with um, the communities we're working with is um, fear of stray dogs as a big limiting factor to um, walking. And so that's not going to be in any of that pedestrian inclusion data. And then another really big issue is um, there's very little data on perceived safety and security, which is one of the biggest determinants of um, the community's willingness to walk. Um, so in order to address um, a more complete picture of safety and security issues, it's really important that we involve communities in every level of um, the planning, the safety planning um, 
and building process um, in order to fill these gaps. So our project, the Community Pedestrian Safety Training Program, um, has been going for seven years, since 2009. It's a joint um, effort between California Walks and Safe Trek um, at UC Berkeley. It's funded through um, OTS, so Office of Traffic and Safety of California, which is funded through Highway Traffic Safety Administration at the national level. Um, so the main, the structure of the CPST workshop is um, we work with the community, we first get invited by the community to work in their neighborhood. Um, then we work with them to organize a one to two day workshop. Um, and then we, in that workshop, we go, we provide them with information on potential tools. So that goes over the six E's, which includes education um, and engineering and all of those, which I'm sure everyone's pretty familiar with. Um, and then we also provide them with information and show them how to use different data collection methods that they can then use to put into um, grants that they're writing up or um, use them to evaluate the programs that um, they put in place. And then we provide them with a space to develop pedestrian and safety action plans. Um, and this, these workshops are often attended by um, a huge group of stakeholders in the community, and this is sometimes sometimes it's the first time that all of these stakeholders have had um, a place to come together and talk about these issues. So it's developing those action plans in those workshops is really critical to what we do. Um, and again, we're funded through um, the California Office of Traffic and Safety. Then, so since 2009, we've worked with over 36 communities across California, so we really tried to get a geographic diversity. Um, we have worked in um, urban, suburban, and rural communities. Last year we began working in First Nation, with First Nations communities on their land. We also tried to work um, with a variety of communities from northern, southern, and um, interior California. I'll pass on to Jim. Yeah. Do you want to stay up there? You want to switch you one second? I'm going to do a quick switcheroo and then I'll give it back to Kate. So we have four overarching program objectives and right after I talk about those, I'm actually going to talk a little bit about the process and you'll notice that there's some overlap between the objectives and the process. So there's some real integration between all of that. One um, is equip. We're really equipping participants with pedestrian safety best practices, that's our skill set. Um, strategies and lessons learned from other communities, so as we continue working, all of this knowledge base grows. We have lots of different examples that we can share. Um, our six E's, which may or may not be slightly different from your six E's, or five or seven, or however many you have. Our equity and empowerment, we could make it seven, but we, we just make that one. Um, evaluation, engineering, enforcement, education, and encouragement. So those are the best practices we go over. Um, and we're working to increase communities' capacity to collect and use data. We'll talk a lot about, or a little bit more at least, about data. There's some data that we have that the state gathers that we use, particularly collision data. Um, but we're also working with communities to collect their own um, quantitative and qualitative data as well. Assess, um, this is one that will definitely show up in the process. We, during the training, participants conduct a hands-on walkability assessment. We've actually expanded so that last year and this year we're now doing um, community pedestrian and bicyclist safety training. So we're doing walk-bike assessments um, to apply what they learned in the best practices portion of the workshop and to develop tailored solutions to their local conditions. So if we're on uh, tribal land, we're probably not going to talk about roundabouts um, and things like that. It's very specific to community conditions and what the community is looking for. We convene, and I think this is a big part of um, our objectives. As Kate mentioned, we're bringing together folks who may not normally um, be together in the same room to talk about these things, to work through some, some difficult questions. So it's community residents, community organizations and NGOs, non-government organizations, um, but also the local and regional agency representatives. Sometimes we have a lot of jurisdictions. We may have a county road running through a city. 
Uh, we may have um, a neighborhood, we just worked in a neighborhood in Modesto, California, where half of the neighborhood is actually city proper, and the other half is county, it's unincorporated, but it's one neighborhood and they identify as one neighborhood. Um, and then we have State Highway that runs through these communities as well. So we're convening all of these folks together along with enforcement and often public health is a great partner to really help facilitate these conversations, some are easier than others, and some are tough conversations. So by leveraging our role as an impartial outside third party, I mean, we're partial, obviously, to pedestrian safety. We do have a bias there. Um, but other than that, you know, we, we want that outcome. Beyond that, we're really there to facilitate um, and work with the community at all levels. And finally, to take action. We're, we're not just there to talk and then leave and, and go away. This is a big part of it. We, facilitate action planning discussions to develop real, tangible, and implementable solutions um, to the local community's issues. And so these different types of actions, um, I'll highlight a couple slides from now that we'll talk about, and they can be short and long term, um, and they can they run a range of implementable solutions. Sometimes we go into communities and they have a, a prescribed goal that they're working toward, that may be a grant application. Um, and other times they may not. They just know that they've got a challenge and they want to start that discussion. And so the process, I realize this is tiny-ish, um, but it really combines um, the community members are the ones that are defining the pedestrian safety issues. And the community members can be broad, that can include agency representatives as well, but really, again, it is the community pedestrian safety training project and we want to hear what users experiences are and what their challenges are and they participate in all facets of the process so that includes defining what the issues are um, and then planning the workshop so we don't just drop in and hold a workshop a big part of this is the planning process that leads up to the workshop so there's a lot of behind the scenes um, work that includes usually two to three um, planning phone calls with all of these different participants as well as, a, as an in-person site visit from our staff where we spend at least half a day if not a full day in the community with some of these um, stakeholders as well getting a lay of the land so we're not just looking at Google Earth um, we look at it before so we have a little bit of an idea but we're actually going to see it in person and then developing um, our next steps so deciding what the potential actions are we'll talk about some of the more successful um, actions that folks have gone through after and then potential outcomes which are a little more long term. I'm going to hand it back to you for a minute. Um, so I, um, at UC, at SafeTrack, I was involved in the evaluation process of looking at um, 24 of the sites that we had done from 2009 to 2014. So we sent follow-up surveys to all 24 sites. Um, 16 actually responded. And then we um, used that follow-up survey with data that we had been um, collecting, that we had collected before the workshop, as well as during, during and after. Um, so the both groups have been really good about writing very detailed reports after each um, workshop, which we can then use for evaluation, so that was very helpful. Um, and the main purpose for doing this evaluation um, was to have constant that um, constant communication with communities, um, as well as get look at um, ag aggregate the data to make sure that our program is working with what pro the communities are um, needing. So we looked at um, overall safety concerns, which um, was on one of the slides before. So making sure that we're addressing the um, broader safety concerns of communities. Then also um, getting feedback that we can then send to the funding departments. Um, in terms of our evaluation, we looked at safety concerns before the workshop and after the workshop, um, and then the initiatives taken after the workshop. Um, and it's really important to note that these um, these these initiatives aren't directly because of the workshop, because there's all this organizing um, and organization of the community before. So the workshop is really just one tool that these communities. 
used to um, improve pedestrian safety in our communities. But it's really amazing that some of these communities are done, which Jane is going to go over a little later. Um, and then also just getting general feedback from the workshops, which has been from the 16 responses were was really positive. So 100% um, of the communities wanted additional training. 92 um, said that there is more enthusiasm from the community after the workshop, and um, then we also got some really great um, feedback from local. Um, elected officials and um, the um, other professionals who are involved in the workshop. So these are these pretty shapes colors are just some of the types of outcomes that we've seen over the years from our um, from the CPST program. Um, and again, we kind of distilled it into buckets. So we've seen infrastructure improvements, actual real live hardscape construction projects, education and enforcement efforts, those non-infrastructure projects, community-based programming, um, coalition building and policy changes, and expanded media coverage and outreach. And a couple of highlights um, from our evaluation effort is that 88% of respondents reported that they continue to be engaged in coalition building. And I think that's a that's a huge win. Um, we're you know we obviously leave after the workshop and, and we produce a report, but the communities are continuing to um, get together and talk about what they're doing and act on that. This is a big deal in the community. They they aren't just stopping this process when we leave either. It continues on. And so I'll be going over a handful of case studies that really highlight some of these initiatives. Um, in three of the communities that we worked with over the years. So the first is Parlier. Um, I wanted to highlight, I know you can read it on the slide, but I really wanted to highlight uh, their demographics uh, to really get into the types of communities that we work in, the varying communities. And we don't actually have a very urban example here, but we do also work in, in urban communities as well. But their population is about 1,400, 1,500, 1,500. Numbers are not working for me today. 98% of their population is Latino. It's a small rural farming community in the Central Valley. Um, and the median household income is around $31,000. The median household income is $48,000 in the, in the state. So it's pretty below our already median income. Um, just to really drive home, um, the challenges in this community, up to 91% of the students qualify for free or reduced meals at school. Um, over a quarter of the youth experience asthma problems. That is not uncommon in California Central Valley. And they have a pretty high unemployment rate despite being a farming community. So how did we get there? Um, uh, Cultiva La Salud is a public health NGO in San Joaquin Valley or Central Valley. and. The Latino Coalition for Healthy California had been working throughout the valley, um, and they had been working to organize residents around public health issues, systemic public health issues. And um, these organizations held a healthy community forum in Parlier and identified, among other priorities, and again, this came from directly from the community, um, the need for safety for children, particularly in regards to traffic safety, including safe routes to school, uh, more crosswalks and enforcing speed limits. And so our partners at Cultiva La Salud then reached out to us and said, hey, perhaps we could have a workshop um, about this. So this is what, what we were looking at specifically. So when we go into a town, we're often looking at a corridor, maybe two corridors. When we go into a larger city, we'll be focusing on a neighborhood and then perhaps one or two or three corridors within that neighborhood. This is Manning Avenue. It's an east-west road through the community, um, signed at 45 miles per hour, or about 70 kilometers per hour, carries heavy agricultural freight traffic. You can obviously see that there are a lot of residential uses to the north, and you start to see more of that agricultural use to the south, but the commercial corridor is along here and on the north and south sides of the road. In red are the sidewalk gaps along that road. 
And so even though the majority of commercial developments and retail that folks want to go to, maybe walking to, are there, they don't have a lot of sidewalk to get there, nor do they have crosswalks to go back and forth. And so this is actually what it looks like on that road. Here are some cyclists biking um, in the shoulder. Um, there is at least a paved shoulder, but um, you'll notice the, the dirt continuation of the shoulder on the right. So when it does rain, uh, there's no drainage. And so when it does rain, that creates hazards both on and off the road with the mud and water. Um, this is a picture of a student crossing after school. Um, there may, we actually think that that is an un unmarked crossing. Um, it looks like there's a curb there. So, you know, people are getting back and forth, want to get back and forth across the street. There are uses um, to go to. So, again, we played a convening role in connecting agencies in Parlier. This is a picture from the workshop, the actual workshop, so after that pre-planning process, after the site visit process, um, and it included the mayor, uh, council members, the city manager, representative from the community development um, office, from the school district, from public health, and from the police department, as well as community members, um, residents, other stakeholders, and our NGO partners. So we really had a wide swath. Um, we aim in all of these workshops to make them as accessible as possible. People live in overplanned communities. People are planned to death sometimes, where they are asked to give their time freely, to go to meetings, to give their input, and never see results from those meetings. Um, we don't want that, but we understand it's a burden to even go in and ask for that, no matter how many partners are there. Um, what we always do is provide translation services in as many languages as we need to. We actually just recently, uh, instead of providing translation services into, say, Spanish, um, or mom, or whichever uh, language we need, we gave our first workshop in Spanish while I uh, provided, I wouldn't call it translation, but I provided simultaneous translation in English so that we actually, our English speaking participants were the ones wearing the headsets at the workshop. Um, and it went very well. And um, I think that was a great experience. We provide food, we will always feed you at our workshops, sometimes twice, uh, and childcare. Um, and in this case, we hosted in the evening to maximize participation, but that's one of the questions we have. Does, it, does the weekend work better? Does the evening work better? Do we need to split this over two days? Um, things like that. And so here um, we are walking on the sidewalk, amazingly. But this is uh, folks out doing the walk audit. Um, we had a specific goal at that point for those of you from California. We have a program called the Active Transportation Program, which is funding um, specifically, go figure, for active transportation. And so we've gone through three rounds of that, and um, their goal really was scoping what their Active Transportation um, Program application, or ATP program application, was going to be for. And to date, they have secured $700,000, the city of Perlier, to address sidewalk gaps along Manning, all those red lines that you saw, um, and to install rectangular rapid flashing beacons for the school crossing. That's a big, big win for a very small city. Um, and doing a workshop like this and having that community buy-in makes them extremely competitive. And that, that's one of the really great outcomes um, from these workshops, I would say. Another success story is Paradise. Um, they're a bit bigger, almost twice as large, 26,500. I'm just going to stop trying to say numbers. They also are a rural community, and they have a challenging terrain. I think um, basically off of the main street is a cliff. Is that correct? I would just you disappear off the main street. We can't fix that. But um, their median household income is a little bit higher, but again, it is below the state's median. Um, here, we were working with partners that were local, including um, California State University Chico's Public Health Center, as well as their county public health department. You may see a theme. We often partner with public health. It's a, it's a great partnership to have. Um, and actually, they were working together throughout the county to identify communities for us to work in, and Paradise wasn't one that they highlighted. Um, until, unfortunately, a student was hit and killed 
um, which prompted the desire for change. Now, we don't want to wait for that to happen, but I have to say that since I've been with California Walks, that often is what prompts this change and has prompted the change in our communities. And we end up working with the parents sometimes, or the ones that, are, that call us, and um, are really the ones that are reaching out first. So for those of you who are agency folks, I would really urge you not to wait for that to happen and, and see if we can be more proactive about this, because there are organizations like us doing this work. Um, so we were invited after that to help facilitate action. Um, this is Skyway before a road diet. So actually by the time we were there, I, I should say, they had applied for um, highway safe and safety improvement program funding but weren't quite sure what it was going to do along Skyway and they knew they wanted a road diet and maybe talking about a road diet wasn't very popular. Um, this is during the walk on it. This is Skyway. It's wide. But, but again, we have things on both sides, and we do have some crosswalks, but there were some issues with some of these crosswalks, uh, and people were talking about maybe removing some of the crosswalks. I don't think at that point the conversation had necessarily pivoted to how to improve the crosswalks, but it was more about removing them and, and, and channeling folks to other crossings. So this is just another view, pre-road diet of Skyway. This is um, during our action planning and during the workshop. So again, the, this workshop revolved around how to take advantage of that funded Highway Safety Improvement Program road diet project funding and maximize that. Um, and for those of you who aren't familiar with that funding, it isn't just for highways. It sounds like it is, but it can be used in active transportation. And I think one of the great wins here is that the community decided that's what they really wanted to focus on, was facilitating uh, pedestrian safety and access along this road. And so this allowed residents to weigh in on whether they were going to keep the crosswalks, certain crosswalks on the Skyway. Um, and ultimately, they decided, of course, they wanted to keep them, and they actually wanted to improve them. And so they developed uh, short and long-term actions that the city could take, or at least consider, um, during the workshop. That was really their ask for the workshop. And so here again, we're walking on part of Skyway that doesn't have uh, sidewalks. That is not the cliff. I was not exaggerating. That's just a bump. And a couple more. I think we took a lot of pictures during this, but, but this is us really getting into discussions. And I have to say, from my experience, this is huge. We're not just we do talk at people, with people, for quite a bit at the beginning of the workshop um, to really give them that toolkit of best practices. But going out and experience it, you'll be surprised at the number of folks who are decision makers who haven't actually walked these streets. Um, in one recent, I won't name the community, but in one recent walk on it, you know, we went out, I was told, you know, two kids from the middle school were hit crossing this street on their bikes. We pressed the button. We never got a crossing signal. Nobody knew that was happening until we went out there. Then we also could see that there were no sight lines on the corners for people to actually see that the kids were probably crossing and didn't have adequate time to cross. They were probably crossing with the light. Didn't have adequate time to cross. A group of 10 of us didn't have adequate time to cross. Um, and it's really eye-opening to go out there and have that experiential walk got it, walk and bike got it. So this is one of the improved crossings, post-road diet. Um, here's another picture. And to date, twice now, through two cycles of that ATP funding, um, then the first cycle, the city was able to secure $2.4 million for two safe routes to school projects to improve walking and biking conditions. Um, the workshop, I think, we think, we believe, directly influenced one project's grant application. And in cycle two, they secured $6.8 million for four pro projects, including um, the downtown Paradise. They renamed their road diet with a fun name, and I don't have the whole name, but the downtown of Paradise Economic Development something or other. That's eight, not, almost $9 million for a city of, of less, fewer than 50,000 people. That's huge. Again, these kind of deep engagement uh, 
workshops make them extremely competitive for those types of projects. More and more grant applications require that community engagement. The ATP is one of them. You get lots more points for that. And it needs to be real. We also review the applications. It needs to be real engagement, not a meeting you call two days before the application is due so you can put in the sign-in sheets. Um, but it's big. The, they also did some public-private partnerships. The street furniture and the bushes, the street greenery was provided by pg and &E, um, which is our local energy, energy company. And who else? I mean, and who else was it? I can't remember. <coughs> and the Rotary Club. So some of it was, it was kind of in kind. You know, it wasn't all funded through the grant. Um, maybe those beautification things aren't, but they were able to uh, secure that through other community partners who were willing to invest in this great project. And the final case study I wanted to go over was Hoopa Valley. Um, Hoopa is the largest um, tribal reservation uh, by land area in the state of California. And we actually have a map here. It's in Northern California. It, has a, it doesn't have a huge population, but by land area, it's large. Um, it has about 2,600 people. The median household income is extremely low, um, nearly 100% of Hoopa Valley elementary students qualify for the free or reduced meal program. Uh, the community clinic estimates that 20% of residents have diabetes, and it has an extremely high unemployment rate. It also... Um, has a state highway that runs through directly through the reservation. That's the main road. And so here's a picture as you enter the reservation. And if it weren't for sort of that desire line, I think you'd think, well, nobody walks here. But it's clear that people do. And there literally is, because I walked this and kind of freaked out um, on the other on the one side of the guardrail. But there literally is a cliff there that's called the blue slide. And and to pass this pass. Um, people are walking back and forth to get to the center of town and to get to school and the services like the health clinic um, on a daily basis. And there's this strange pedestrian signal that you can barely see there that kind of blinks, but we couldn't find the button for it, but it's to let you know pedestrians might be crossing as you barrel around that corner that has no shoulders. Um, so here is somebody walking along State Route 96. And um, here you see an abrupt transition from a posted 45 mile an hour zone to a school zone just up ahead of 25. Um, so these are some of the conditions we're looking at approaching the center of town or the, the center of the reservation where the school and services are. Just one more. Most students are bused in. It's over an hour ride for a number of students. 40% um, of students that live within a quarter of a mile of the school do walk on no sidewalks and, again, on some no non-paved shoulders. 60% of them walk home. So more students are being bused in the morning. Many more are walking home in the afternoon. And you can imagine as you get into to fall and winter, you know, it gets dark earlier, so they could be walking home when it's beginning to get darker dusk and it's harder to see. So here's actually just a, a picture of the well-worn path in front of the school athletic clubs that run across, run along, and the school athletic clubs, I'm sorry, run along these sort of as an exercise route, um, right along State Route 96. So this is a picture from our workshop, and what was interesting here is that um, this has helped open up funding to a historically um, underserved community. They never received state or federal funding in the past, um, in part because of the lack of data um, and the limitations of data. And in cycle two after our workshop, in cycle two of the ATP, um, they received $1.3 million to construct a side path um, from that blue slide, the scary part that I couldn't cross without holding onto the guardrail, um, to the main part of town that goes past the school. Um, and it also includes non-infrastructure activities, and that was, a, that was a specific request from the community, that this needed to make sense for the community. So the community priorities are reflected in the project, and instead of walk to school day, they'll have a salmon run, because that's reflective of the community and their desires. Um, 
Here we have people crowdsourcing collision data. We had absolutely no collision data on the tribal land um, for a number of reasons. And it's amazing what happens with uh, when you put up a map and people know who was hit, who was injured, who was killed, exactly where and when it happened, um, all of the details, and there's no record of it um, as far as the Office of Traffic Safety is concerned, and you need that data to apply for grants. So part of what, what um, we do in these workshops is this crowdsourcing, and part of what Safe Check is doing is trying to create a much more robust database of tribal um, collision data. Our key takeaways. Do we have time? Am I over? Are we good? Four minutes. Okay. Uh, we can talk about it from down here. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Hello? Um, so one of our main key takeaways is the limitations of data, like I outlined before. Um, and so there, especially in the rural areas where there is limited data, um, it's really difficult to recognize where we need to be putting our efforts. Um, so having the community involved in all aspects of the workshop process is really critical to that. Another um, issue that we ran into was um, a lot of the initiatives taken after the workshop um, take a little while. So you can't do evaluation six months after you've done the workshop because there might be a grant that is in the process. and. Um, the community might not know if they actually are receiving that. Um, it also takes a while for collisions to be built, and um, so continued long-term evaluation is really critical. Hello? Is this one on? No? Yes. 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 Oh, I'll just speak louder. That one is very sensitive over there. So being humble, um, you know, we're, again, we, we are invited by the community. It's, it's not we're typically not a part of these communities necessarily. Some of them we do live in, um, but we don't live everywhere in California, so we're invited by the community. We are their guests, and we're really there to co-empower the residents um, to work with the agencies. We, we have a specific skill set that we want to share, but again, we're, we're, we're biased towards safety and mobility and accessibility, and that's about it. Um, we serve as facilitators, and it's, it's a really humbling experience um, and an extremely powerful one to be uh, involved in that. Um, staying in it for the long haul, I, I wanted to reiterate, I know I said before, but it's really important that pre-planning pre, pre process to get the stakeholders on board, um, not to call public works up like the week before the workshop and invite them and make them feel like they're on the spot. So while a lot of it is that pre-engagement with community members. I think a big takeaway has been um, really reminding people, again, that as facilitators, we're there to lift up the good, the good work of the agency folks as well. Um, agency folks aren't known for agency, it's not agency, well, that's another, that's another session. Agency folks aren't known for necessarily being um, really good about publicizing all the great work that they're doing. And we can do that, but we don't always know that. And we aren't there to attack anybody. And so we do, you, that work needs to happen up front. We need to talk about that up front and make folks feel comfortable. And it may be a separate phone call or a separate meeting um, to get there. And I think that's really important. And then that pre, that post-workshop planning and support, again, we provide a, a report out um, for the workshop that often can be supplemental to those applications or can inform them or other processes. But it also, um, we're there to write support letters. We're there to review grant applications. We aren't leaving. Now, we do need funding to continue to do this work. I always have to say that because we're a nonprofit. Um, but, but we don't just leave. We're there to really support for the long term and see these successes out. Um, one big challenge is fostering community read readiness. I think we mentioned the desire, the need for community re readiness is one of the things that we need. Um, to really go in, and so it's, it's a bit of a catch-22. Many of these communities that, that really want to work on their pedestrian safety don't have that community readiness yet. So how can we kind of work to organize that um, in advance? Where does our work fit to make that happen? Is it finding the local NGO that is um, 
looking at systemic public health issues, but maybe hadn't considered pedestrian or bicyclist safety as a public health issue yet. So we can do outreach there so that that becomes a part of the conversation. Um, and maybe a government task force that starts to look at it and we can kind of put a bug in people's ear there. So it can be a challenging but not impossible and, and often we're really happy to see that that community readiness, cohesion, the coalitions, they grow after these workshops and only build upon you know, the successes of that day or that planning process and really grow. Um, I think that's it. For me? For me. I think we're out of time, so I'm why sorry. don't we give a round of applause to our Uh, I know it's the end of the day, so I won't keep you any longer, but if you guys have questions, any, any burning questions? All right. Oh, yes. Burning. Well, burning. Yeah, I mean, if you want to do it afterwards. We'll, we'll also well, do I it have a, it's a burning question. Yes. I, I love when you talk about the beginning of your presentation investments that we make and set the legacy for the future of the city. I mean, they, they don't go away. Changes to the built environment are very slow to change, but they have very lasting impact. And I love listening to this. One of the things I was wondering about is uh, you have a little bit of a policy change and different actions they can take. Is I think you know is there discussions about whether these communities after these you know these first wins or first successes look at doing more kind of systemic institutional mm -hmm. change? Because that's when we really you know that's kind of where where I see the the big change having change you know, the, the overall planning, project scoping, implementation. And, is there kind of, you know, is, is that being talked about with this project? Yes, so um, I won't say that we've gotten like crazy transportation policies passed, but we've gotten like small policies that will live on for a long time. So in the Paradise example, they actually adopted a daylighting policy, crosswalk daylighting policy, like immediately right after the workshop. They've adopted a, um, a developer requirement for installing sidewalks, which I was surprised they didn't already have. <laughs> Um, in the city of Glendale, which is in Southern California, um, we had a bunch of um, policy recommendations in the report that we generated, and they actually took that to their city council, who then adopted them. So the Department of Public Works um, systematized a lot of um, different policies around like, data lighting, around prioritization of um, market crossings and safety enhancements and the, and the like. So um, policy is definitely part of the discussion, depending on the community, let's say. Yes? So my question is about sort of the, the initial um, outreach and the suggestions you have for making it um, meaningful for community members. You talked about sort of a history of coordination and correlation, but that in some urban communities, at least in ours, I feel like we sort of outreach people to exhaustion because if they're in a certain census tract that has a certain Halifax score, like we're going after every grant imaginable there, and the port's doing outreach about port impacts, and the state is doing outreach about the highway system, and we're doing local outreach about the built environment, and about active transportation, and then the health department doing other outreach about asthma, and the school district about um, educational outcomes, and like, <coughs> these are people that have less free time than you and I. They're yep. working two jobs with being school parents and taking care of their kids. So, how you know? How can you make it relevant to go through yet another sort of exercise? So the issue of planning fatigue, right? Yeah. And outreach fatigue. Um, Jamie, you want to talk? Oh, yeah, I was going to make a bad joke. I wasn't going to do that. I was going to say then you need to study the planning fatigue later and the impacts of that. But um, one thing, and it's e much easier said than done, but I think it's just a, a way we need to start thinking differently is that some of those those processes overlap um, and and that's sort of coordination we all get so frustrated we get a new bike lane and then three weeks later the sewer comes in and they tear it up because there was a coordination it's similar you know if you're looking at, at, at asthma something the port's probably looking at something like that too so in one community um, on a separate project I wanted to go in and do a project and they were like that sounds great but we're so we talked with public health because public health was already going in to look at some walkability uh, and access to parks. And I, I, we were able to work it out so that they overlapped and so that they became one process and we got, we all got the outcomes we were looking for. Um, but instead of, of engaging the community multiple times, and I think our, our 
NGO partner in the community was great at being firm about, no, we're not going to have another meeting. You're going to make it work. Um, I think that part of that is co-empowering those people that are in the community to be able to say that. Let them know that they, they have boundaries and we need to work with those. But I think it's also coordinating among all the agencies and all the different NGOs to figure out how some of this stuff overlaps. And again, that's easier said than done. Um, tying it to a known quantity, that there is an a grant application that's coming up, can be much more enticing, I think. If you know you've got a deadline and you might want to be able to apply for the funding, that might help you sneak in. But I would say, um, do you work for an agency? Or? Yeah. Okay, so I would say that a lot of this work really is around relationship building and cultivating trust. Yeah. And so, don't wait to the last minute, you know, trying to get input on a process or a plan. You know, be there for, and make partnerships and relationships with your NGO partners because they more likely have deeper relationships than you with actual residents. So create that relationship, you know, now, yesterday. <laughs> Uh, and continue to work and engage uh, on the issues that they're working on. Be a good partner. Um, and what I think once you've developed that relationship, it's much easier to then plug NGOs and residents into the formal planning process or formal project scoping process. Particularly if they see outcomes. Yeah. Particularly if they see outcomes that are, that are what they're asking for. Yes. My, I just wanted to throw sort of like, and those the future thoughts, like those, all those things are separate now, but with big data and the type of research that people are starting to do on pedestrians and trying to integrate everything, down the line, <coughs> these aren't going to be separate conversations. We're going to have expressions for health environment and data and asthma and you know noise pollution all in one with some of the work that people are trying to do now. This is just now. Or, you know, future is different. Thank you. I think we'll end on that note. Bright future, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for taking your time.